Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for your patience. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, we should be back up and running here in a second. Uh, sorry for the trouble, um, but I think we're uh, working in the right direction now. All right. Do you want me to kick it off, Joe? Yep. Go right ahead, Caitlin. Okay. Um, All right. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Caitlin Gannon. I'm from the Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve, which I will tell you all about. Um, I hope you're all doing well, um, staying safe at home. Um, I will talk about the Jacques Cousteau Reserve a little bit, um, about a little bit about what we do at the reserve, and then um, also what we've been up to lately. So I'll go ahead and switch and kick us off. Okay, so I'll take uh, just a few seconds to pause. And before we go any further, um, I wanna see if you guys uh, can stop for a second and think of what is an estuary. Um, if you've heard of the estuary, the term estuary before, um, if it's new to you, that's great. Um, but what do you think it is? I have some clues down below, some photos. Um, so I'll give you about 10 seconds or so to give it a, th uh, give it some thought. All right, well, you can see there's definitely a lot of water in the photos below. So it is where the rivers meet the sea. So we have some pictures of rivers, uh, connecting to, uh, the ocean and, um, However, there uh, is a little bit more to estuaries than just where rivers uh, meet the sea. Um, there's actually freshwater estuaries as well. Um, so we, we do like to tell folks um, in a, um, if we are out doing programs um, or uh, connecting with the public, um, you know, a, a brief definition is, is where rivers meet the sea. And, um, so we'll say that often, but we do have fresh wet water estuaries. We don't want to forget them either. Um, so maybe a little bit better description is where two bodies of water with uh, different chemical and physical characteristics will meet and mix. Um, so we do have uh, estuaries, for example, uh, up by the Great Lakes which I'll show you on a map. There's a couple of them uh, in um, like on uh, Ontario, or I'm sorry, uh, Superior, at Lake Huron, um, that I'll show you in just a second. Um, so it's really more of two, two different kinds of water mixing. Um, and for our friends up in the Great Lakes, it would be, you know, where rivers meet lakes. So uh, the Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve is actually part of a national network of other uh, estuarine research reserves. You can see uh, we're right there in New Jersey, number nine, um, but there are a ton, there's 30 total list of reserves around the country. Uh, we have many on the East Coast, Gulf Coast, West Coast. Uh, those two that we have in the Great Lakes are freshwater estuaries. Uh, and then Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. So the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is uh, all funded through NOAA and the U.S. Department of Commerce. And each estuary, though, uh, we're all on the, under the umbrella of the NEARS, um, but we're all managed um, a little bit differently um, by a state uh, entity. Um, it could be a state university, um, many are also uh, managed by uh, state DEP, um, and then even actually some are managed through uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, so we're all sort of united, but a little bit different. Um, and each one of our estuaries is very different. Um, so for example, New Jersey estuaries are different from down in Southern Florida where they might have some mangroves. Um, or different from the ones out in California, um, Alaska, Hawaii. Uh, so it's, it's all really unique and different, um, and, uh, but we're all connected and we all collaborate with one another as well. So it's really unique. Now we're the only NEARS that is named after a person. Uh, the Jacques Cousteau 
And uh, so the JC Near was designated on October 20th, 1997. Um, and a congressman at the time, his name was Congressman Saxton, uh, wanted to dedicate our New Jersey reserve to Jacques Cousteau uh, because that is the same year that he had passed away. So during our designation, uh, in 1997, a few of Jacques Cousteau's family members were actually there um, to dedicate it in honor of him. Now, a little bit of um, the boundaries of the reserve and um, the size of the reserve and give you perspective where it is within New Jersey. Um, the Jacques Cousteau Reserve is within all of that red area on the map. Um, it's a little over 116,000 acres spans within uh, throughout three counties. Um, and much of it is also within the New Jersey Pinelands Management Area. So you, it, on the map, you can see that's um, in the dotted line. Um, you can see how, how large the area is and, and much of the, the, the estuary and the Mullica River watershed is within uh, Pine Barrens. So here's um, a map of the Mullica River Great Bay watershed. Uh, and then within the watershed is our estuary, the Jacques Cousteau near estuary. Um, so to give a little bit of difference um, in the two, again, our estuary is where our river uh, meets with the ocean. Um, and then around it, you have the watershed. So that's an area of land that kind of acts like a basin whenever we have precipitation, uh, the direction of flow of that uh, storm water um, is how we designate a watershed and separate it from um, another watershed. So you can see all of the small little rivers that meet into the Mullica River. So any water precipitation that falls within the Mullica River Great Bay watershed will end up in one of these um, rivers and then ultimately make its way to the Mullica River Great Bay and then ultimately to the ocean. Um, so this map does show two different stars. One star is an area called Lower Bank, which is 13 miles up the river, the Mullica River. Uh, the red star is Batstow, uh, it's 21 miles. And I want you guys to take a second and think about how far up the river do you think is like the ultimate or upper limit of saltwater inundation from the ocean? Um, because in an estuary you have that gradient of salinity throughout and it's different in different parts of the estuary depending on how close or far away you get to the ocean. So where do you think like the upper limit of salt water is within the Malacca River? Do you think it's the Black Star? Or do you think it's the red star? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. So when I made this question, I actually sort of made it a trick question <laughs> because both are correct, um, kind of. So on a usual kind of everyday uh, basis, it's lower bank, which is the black star. That's a, it's, has, that is how far up saltwater inundation goes up river. However, it can get salty up by Batstow if we do have a large storm event um, or weather that's um, impacting the tides and ocean water can go up all the way. Now it's not, you know, 100% salty ocean water, but it can get a little salty influenced from the ocean if we do have some sort of uh, meteorological event that takes place that influences salt water all the way up the river. Um, it's a pretty narrow river in some parts, so sometimes it gets squeezed and shot right up. Um, so for example, during Superstorm Sandy, um, we did have some saltiness up by the Red Star within the, the watershed uh, which is really interesting. So this gives you an idea also of our um, boundaries and also our land management partners. So we don't own all 116,000 acres of the reserve. Um, it's actually a patchwork 
of all different kinds of state forests and, and wildlife management areas that collectively make up the reserve. Um, you can see in the borough of Tuckerton, there's a little dot here. That's our coastal education center. And that's where we do have a lot of our staff. Um, we have offices there, we have dormitories there, and that's where our classroom is. Also nearby at the seaport is uh, where our exhibit um, also is as well. Um, then we have the Rutgers Marine uh, Field Station at the end of the peninsula here, um, where we do some of our work in partnership with Rutgers University Field Station staff. Um, but the reserve is also, you know, beyond that. Um, the reserve is made up by Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, um, Swan Bay Wildlife Management Area, parts of Bass River, Wharton State Forest, um, Great Bay Boulevard Wildlife Management Area. So all of these collectively, again, are uh, is the JC Near and all of our land management partners. Uh, all right, and we also have different habitats within the reserve that are very important um, and we educate about often. Um, in the upper portion of the estuary, we have the Pine Barrens ecosystem, um, and then we have different wetlands. We have saltwater wetlands and freshwater wetlands, barrier islands, and then even uh, parts of the open ocean, uh, we would consider part of the JC near too. So we'll start with the Pine Barrens. Um, you know, this area is, is a huge part of the watershed like we talked about earlier. 75% of the Malika River watershed is within Pinelands Management Area. So you can see that on the map there. Um, now this makes our watershed very unique and set apart from the other watersheds that are within New Jersey. There are 20 watersheds total. Um, and because we're a, we comprise of a lot of the Pine Barrens, there's not a whole lot of human development in our watershed, um, which is a pretty, that's a good thing, um, especially if we're talking about water quality and uh, um, the, the habitats that are within the watershed. Um, we don't have a lot of pollution runoff um, and we do have those, those storms. So the water quality within the bay and within the estuary is actually very good. Uh, so it's actually so healthy that um, many scientists will use the estuary as a baseline to uh, compare it to other watersheds as far as water quality goes. Um, so that's really great. We like to brag that we are a very clean estuary uh, in New Jersey. We're actually one of the cleanest between DC and Boston on the Eastern seaboard. So, um, so that's really great. And a lot of it has to do with the neighboring uh, Pine Barrens. The Pine Barrens also filter out a lot of those um, impurities and toxins that do come, uh, come with uh, water and precipitation runoff if there happens to be any um, before it makes its way into the Mullica River. Um, so just some uh, uh, background um, on some Pine Barrens critters here. Um, there are some endemic species, um, ones that are you know, uh, found within Pine Barrens only, which is really special. Um, so we have some examples like the Pine Barrens tree frog, um, American bittern, and um, all of these critters, uh, even though the Pine Barrens is quite acidic and it's water from all the tannins in the, uh, the neighboring vegetation, um, not a lot of uh, great soil uh, quality. It's very sandy um, and it's mostly like the name suggests, very, you know, mostly pine and barren of anything else. Um, so conditions are kind of harsh uh, within Pine Barrens, but there are a lot of animals that call it home and, and are especially adapted for living here. Um, then if uh, you can imagine you're kayaking down the Mullica, you start in the Pine Barrens and you make your way to the coastal wetlands, you have your unique species there too. This is where we start to get to more brackish water. And uh, we have different critters here too. We have different types of uh, small schooling fish, um, flatfish, uh, we have a unique species of reptile uh, or turtle, uh, the diamondback terrapin, which is the only species of turtle that is adapted to living in brackish water, which is why it gets its name terrapin. 
Uh, and then we have eels. Um, so this is a unique species which will migrate from freshwater habitats to the salty open ocean water um, and then back, back up again um, as juveniles. Um, so this is something also that we're going to be looking into into the future for future citizen science efforts, which is really exciting. And that's collecting and monitoring uh, juvenile eels that are making their way up through the estuary. So that's really neat. I'll get to a little bit more on that later. And then we are uh, out in the, in the bay close to the inlet where the ocean is. Um, in this photo, you can see, um, hopefully you can see my mouse, but the, the tip of this peninsula is the um, Rutgers U University Marine Field Station. Um, and then here is the um, fish um, or Menhaden processing plant, which is abandoned right now, or it has been for quite a while. Um, and then Brigantine and uh, LBI to the north. So now we're in Great Bay. Uh, you see a little bit more larger predatory fish, um, weak fish, drum. Um, we've got flounder, uh, striped bass. Um, so we have a lot of uh, recreationally popular fish out here too. So you'll see a lot of boaters and fishermen. Um, now I just wanted to mention real quick on this guy right here, this is, it looks like a little battery pack uh, attached to this flounder. Um, our research coordinator uh, years ago was doing a fish tracking study on flounder and he put a, a tracking device on, on the fish and there are remote uh, sensors placed throughout the bay. And if a fish with this little battery pack swam close to one of these remote sensors, um, it will record uh, where that fish is exactly and he can he can track fish that way. Um, he likes to call it easy pass for fish because it works very similarly to easy the easy pass device that you have in your car. Um, it's just for um, tracking fish and um, learning more about where they move and where they go um, for fisheries um, management uh, purposes. So there's a lot of biodiversity uh, within the estuary, whether you're up in the Pine Barrens or close to the inlet in the mouth of the ocean there. Um, many of them are year round and a lot of species are also seasonal. Um, everything from your plankton and your filter feeders at the bottom of the food web all the way up to your apex predators, such as ospreys, um, which all of the, the little guys are probably learning how to fish on their own right now. And uh, a lot of these species will also breed in the estuary and come here um, to lay their eggs or mate. Um, much of the seafood that we consume uh, start their life in a brackish water habitat. Um, so the estuary is very important for, um, uh, for production, for life. It's a very productive uh, and dynamic uh, area. Um, so especially if we um, like to eat seafood or go birding or do any of these, uh, these things, recreational things in the estuary. Um, some other ecosystem services that the estuary provides. Um, we talked a little bit about precipitation runoff um, and filtration of the Pine Barrens and um, wetlands do this too. So as water is flowing throughout the watershed, um, it will, uh, vegetation will slow the flow and allow for uh, impurities or other toxins or pollution to settle. Um, and also it actually gets taken up by a lot of uh, the root systems of the plants too. And they filter out um, pollution that way as well. Um, so it'll, in the bottom right corner, you can see that um, process happening just with, with water alone, but a lot of those other chemicals get taken up by the plant systems and root systems as well. 
Um, some of it also will settle and then go down into the ground as groundwater. Um, I'm sure as many, many of you know about the, the large aquifers that we have under New Jersey, specifically under the Pine Barrens. So they act like a large filter uh, for, uh, for rainwater and then it gets stored down there um, as groundwater and we have a large amount of that um, underneath New Jersey, which is really neat. Um, so absorption of water, filtration of, of water, kind of uh, quote unquote cleaning the water as it flows through the estuary. Um, and it also protects us. Uh, we have a picture of a salt marsh on the top right. Um, and they protect us from large storms, uh, wind, waves, uh, barrier islands do this as well, but salt marshes um, will also take a lot of that impact and energy from storms that are uh, coming up the coast. Uh, coastal resources, we talked a little bit about this with, you know, recreational species that are really popular. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's a nursery for many organisms. Oyster cram, uh, clams, crabs, <clears throat> bunker, and uh, much more. Um, and we still have a lot of clamming and oystermen that are out there and crabbers um, that are all commercial um, fisheries um, and the bay provides all of that for us. So we get a lot of great local seafood. Uh, and like, like we mentioned, provides recreational activities for a lot of people, um, provides ecotourism and stimulates economic growth. So that's a little bit about uh, the, the estuary itself. And right now we'll kind of uh, switch gears and go into what we do at the JC Near. Um, so every Nears uh, throughout the country have four main sectors. Um, it's coastal resiliency, stewardship, education, and research. Um, so we'll go into each of those briefly. Um, and along with that, we also do have other staff that are very helpful and uh, contribute a lot to the JC Near. Um, we have volu a volunteer coordinator, we have communications coordinator, um, uh, interpretive coordinator, special projects coordinator. <laughs> um, but within each reserve, uh, I'll go into the, the four main sectors um, just because of time. So. Um, we have a coastal resiliency uh, person, or it's also known as a coastal training program coordinator um, or CTP. And their uh, job is to educate on best coastal decisions. So they work a lot with um, coastal decision makers. So that's uh, city planners, mayors, uh, engineers, and um, others who are making uh, choices about um, the townships or municipalities that live along the coastline. Um, they educate about various coastal hazards, one of them uh, being sea level rise, um, preparing for storms, how best to prepare your community for an event to occur. Um, so they, they do a lot of trainings and workshops for these um, different stakeholders and uh, provide a lot of great materials for them as well, digital materials too. So that's really um, helpful for, you know, when it's hurricane season or when we have, you know, we're starting to see more sunny day flooding uh, in these coastal towns. We also have uh, research and monitoring. So um, we have research efforts that go on um, they're all a little bit different at each reserve, depending on the, you know, research interests of that reserve and the, um, maybe the, the environmental um, issues and things that are occurring at that site. Um, we have an ongoing, this is mostly through Rutgers Marine uh, Field Station, um, but the JC Near is, is involved in this too, especially with providing help, like volunteer help. Um, and our research coordinator uh, is also an associate professor at Rutgers University. His name is Dr. Thomas Grotus. Um, so he is very much involved in ichthyoplankton studies. Uh, ichthyoplankton is essentially baby fish. 
uh, or larval fish, and they are collected in this uh, large mesh net. Um, so that's what the picture is down below um, in the right hand corner there. And um, this, this project has been going on um, uh, a couple of times a month uh, for the last uh, about 30 years or so. They only missed plankton sampling or ichthyoplankton sampling a few times since then. And one was when it was super, super cold and they couldn't break the, the water because it was so iced over. Um, they couldn't collect water because it was just all ice or they, sorry, they couldn't collect plankton in the water because it was all ice. Um, and then the other time actually was when her uh, Superstorm Sandy came through. Um, so they weren't collecting then either. Um, and uh, so we also have some other fun tools and toys. Um, one of them is Remus, which is an um, remotely operated underwater vehicle. And it's also autonomous, so it can kind of think on its own a little bit. You have to program it too, of course, um, but it can do all sorts of neat things. It could scan the bottom for you with, with sonar. It could um, pick up on a tagged fish nearby. It can collect water samples for you. Um, so that's a pretty neat device. And our research, co research coordinator has used it um, on multiple research um, endeavors. And then um, uh, one project that's going on right now that's um, been, been happening for a few years uh, through our research coordinator, he's very interested in fish and fish and fisheries. He's a fisheries biologist. Um, so he has been doing this project um, in and around the Oyster Creek Nuclear Generating Station. And uh, he's been uh, doing trawls of various fish within the Barnegat Bay um, and looking at the um, pre-shutdown um, uh, and looking at the different various species of fish within the bay pre-shutdown and post-shutdown of the plant since the plant um, uh, will use, will take in water to um, cool down the reactors and then it will kind of spit that water back out. It's not radioactive, but it is very warm since the reactors are so warm. Um, so he's seeing if that warm water has an effect on any of the species and if they, um, you know, maybe some species might stick around or might when they should be migrating. So he's interested in learning about that and it's still an ongoing effort. Um, and then we do a lot of monitoring as well. We monitor the salt marsh and the water quality of the estuary. Uh, so you can see Greg has a picture there of a, a sond, um, which has all different um, measuring, <clears throat> excuse me, parameters that measure water quality, like um, turbidity or clarity of the water, um, the pH, the temperature, dissolved oxygen. And so this gives us kind of a record of how healthy our estuary is, is doing. And then also in the picture below, um, we have just a, someone who's measuring the marsh um, and if it's uh, losing or gaining sediment, um, which is really important to know in areas that are experiencing sea level rise and to see if our salt marshes are able to keep up with sea level rise. So we're measuring our marsh sediment as well. Uh, um, also part of monitoring what's really interesting and accessible to a lot of people, well, to anybody really, um, is our system-wide monitoring program, which um, you can access this uh, water quality data online at nearsdata.org, N-E-R-R-S data.org. And it can give you, um, you can create graphs um, this is great for uh, teachers or um, maybe some oyster farmers or coastal decision makers about, you know, what all of these parameters looked like when certain events occurred. And uh, it's, it's great data to use also in real time. So you can get real time data of, you know, what's the precipitation, what's the local temperature, um, what's the salinity like right now. Um, so it's a great tool. And this is also near wide. So every reserve has this kind of data 
And it's really interesting. It can show us uh, even uh, storm data. So we like to say that estuary or sorry, that data likes to tell a story. And this estuary data definitely tells um, a really interesting story uh, about two storms that I think a lot of New Jersey residents uh, do remember quite well. One is uh, Irene, and then the other one is Superstorm Sandy. Um, so you can see the track of Irene is in the top, top map, and it kind of hugged the coast for a long time before it reached New Jersey. And storms do, when they come through, um, they have very low barometric or atmospheric pressure. Um, so you can see the graph on the right, um, all the different reserves, all, each color represents a different reserve along the East Coast. Um, so we have East Coast reserves in Delaware, Chesapeake Bay, North Carolina, Georgia, and you can kind of see in the data the storm traveling up the coast. Um, you know, you can see it when it reached, reached the East Coast on the 27th um, because North Carolina reserves had a dip in barometric pressure. And then the next one is the Chesapeake Bay, Virginia that had it on the 28th. And then you can see the JC near is in red and when it hit us, um, when it reached us um, in red. Now, Sandy was a little bit different. Um, it stayed off the coast for a long time and made that sharp left. So many of the East Coast reserves have no drop in barometric pressure, um, but the ones that were impacted the most in the upper mid-Atlantic or East Coast was JC Near, which you can see in red again, um, Delaware, and then Hudson River, New York. Um, so all of us had drops in barometric pressure, but um, the others didn't. So again, it is kind of like a like storytelling, um, and it's really neat to see that information reflected in data. And again, it's used for teaching um, or for anyone else who is interested in, in using it. And uh, stewardship. So um, our stewardship coordinator uh, does do a lot with our peninsula, um, uh, the Great Bay uh, Wildlife Management Area is where we have many of our uh, set stations. This is a uh, surface elevation table areas where we are measuring marsh soil accretion or erosion. Um, so they, they do monitor these sites. They also do some vegetation monitoring, uh, vegetation monitoring um, every couple of years. Um, so they're responsible for, um, for all of our, our marsh management um, and monitoring efforts. Um, our stewardship coordinator specifically is very knowledgeable in ARC GIS mapping projects. So um, she's do, she does a lot with land use mapping and uh, creating uh, maps, other maps for research efforts or purposes. And also recently we've done um, some soundscape technology where we've put uh, sound boxes throughout our trail, which is behind our education center, and it captures all the ambient sounds um, within, uh, I forget the radius, but within the, the local area. Um, so it can capture sounds of animals, it can capture sounds of humans, and we're all, a lot of the reserves are starting to incorporate this into um, their, their stewardship efforts to monitor what kind of sounds uh, that are they're being collected and use it for data, but also kind of use it for uh, maybe some educational purposes as well. Um, it's kind of a neat new project. And then the Rutgers Marine Field Station, a lot of our staff do come here to analyze our water quality data or analyze other data. Um, so we have a, a good partnership with the other Rutgers res Marine researchers uh, just down the road from us. And then our education programs. So these can be public programs, either that we coordinate or do outreach, like what I'm doing right now. Um, we also do K through 12 programs. Uh, so I'll occasionally have uh, students visit the reserve or we'll have our summer nature programs for children. And then I also offer teacher professional development 
um, once to two times a year. They're, they're usually large uh, multi-day professional development for both formal and informal teachers. So I just had my uh, a big professional development workshop back in August. Um, and that was for three days and it was virtual, which was a little different, but it, it turned out great. And um, a big part of my, my job is outreach and science interpretation and communication to lots of various audiences. Um, you know, we also do that through social media and all sorts of other digital platforms too. Uh, so how to visit us now, of course, unfortunately we can't have any visitors right now at our building at 130 Great Bay Boulevard, which is the Coastal Education Center. Um, this is where we have our trail and where we do classroom events. We, have a, we do have a large classroom for uh, speakers, meetings, um, that is closed. Our trail has been open uh, during COVID-19 and it's in the back of the building. You can see all those trees in the back and it's a, about a half mile loop and it takes you out to the marsh. It's a really great, nice little trail. Um, unfortunately though, that is now closed um, just because we have some downed trees from uh, Tropical Storm ECES. So that uh, is now not accessible anymore because the trees are in a dangerous spot and we wanna make sure we have those trees taken care of before we open the trail back up again. Um, but the trail has been opened uh, during our, our COVID-19 era since about March or so. And then another way you can visit us is our educational exhibit. Um, our educational exhibit is not at our Coastal Education Center. It's actually at the Tuckerton Seaport. Um, if you go to the seaport up to their second floor of their main building, you'll see the JC Near exhibit and it's very interactive. Um, again, not open uh, due to COVID-19, but once it does open, we encourage you guys to just, you know, drive down the road a little bit and around the corner and you'll be at the seaport and you can go inside. Um, so what have we have been up to uh, since March? Uh, we've actually been up to a lot. I feel like uh, myself and many of our colleagues have actually gotten a little bit busier, which um, is in a, in a way um, good during a time of um, that's so stressful and uncertain. Um, so we've been doing virtual programming, um, educational presentations uh, that we offer through the JC NEAR. Um, we give updates about those through our um, email list serve and through our uh, Facebook page. Um, unfortunately, we can't really send out brochures in the mail. We used to do that too, um, but right now that's kind of put, being put on hold. So we're trying to do our advertising through digital means as best as we can. Um, but we also had um, this past summer a, an internship, uh, a graduate internship, which was virtual. Um, it was very interesting for us, but they, the undergrads did a, a great job. Um, we had an undergraduate for every sector. So I had one that did some educational projects and we had one that did research and analyzed some research data actually from the Oyster Creek nuclear generating station. Um, we had a stewardship uh, intern that analyzed some sounds from the soundscape ecology in the sound box. Um, and then we also had a CTP um, or coastal training uh, intern as well who did uh, a project too. And actually a little bit about each of the interns and their projects can be found on our Facebook page if you are interested in learning more about what they did over the summertime. Um, we also did have a graduate fellow who started um, this summer as well, and she will be doing work with us about until 2022. And she is very interested in um, toxic algal blooms that are occurring in salt marshes. So that should be really interesting. So she just got started. Um, we're doing a lot of trail stewardship efforts. Um, like I mentioned, the soundscape ecology. We also have critter cams that are monitoring the trail and what kind of critters we have out on the trail. Um, some volunteers have helped us analyze the, the critter cams too. So that's, that's great. 
Um, we've also had a trail stewards team, which is also comprised of our volunteers. Um, it's a, a solo uh, volunteer job. So one volunteer at a time, or if you do want to bring, um, you know, someone from the same household, uh, you can, but just basically to patrol our trail while it is in use and see, you know, if there's any down trees, if there's any, um, anything that needs to be maintained or fixed or, or chopped down that could be a hazard. Um, our trail stewards team is active and out there looking for what's going on with our trail and keeping us updated uh, on that. We also had some citizen science opportunities during this time as well. We actually had two BioBlitz events that occurred in May. Uh, well, one occurred in May, the other occurred in June. Um, so a bio blitz is where we have citizens that go out and help record and log different species within a habitat. And we had one that was self-guided. So you used your phone, you can download an app that's called iNaturalist and you can join a specific project and then log different critters that you see and so we had one that was self-guided for anyone who was interested, you know, it could be members of the community, it could be teachers, it could be um, our volunteers, whoever, whoever wanted to join can join and help us log different critters that they see on our trail and also along Great Bay Boulevard. Um, the next month in June, we had an experts only bio blitz. Um, so that's where we invited scientists who are very good at identifying various species and some of our um, staff chipped in and helped too and um, we recorded um, different different critters throughout I would say about a, a little over a 12 hour period. Um, the teams were super small and spread out throughout our trail keeping it social distance and COVID friendly um, and we uh, made a a fun infographic all about that. Um, we had about 276 species identified, uh, four, uh, sorry, 415 observations and 18 people who participated. So that was really fun too. And um, we're also looking for people to help us scout and look for different um, areas that might have a lot of monofilament line. Um, that's the fishing line that you find um, on fishing rods and fishing poles. And it's a pretty uh, deadly form of marine debris if it is loose in the environment. So um, we're looking to maybe have a monofilament collection team. This is kind of in the um, preliminary stages. So we're sort of looking to see what areas might have a lot of monofilament. If you know of any, we'd certainly love to hear from you. Um, and then have our volunteers go out and collect at these areas that tend to be maybe um, maybe popular fishing spots or just for some reason anywhere where we have a lot of monofilament. Um, and then also our eel monitoring efforts um, were uh, planned for this year but are getting pushed back a year because of COVID-19. And um, that's another citizen science effort that we are really excited about and happy to get that project off the ground with the help from our friends at the Hudson River Reserve. Um, and that's where we have community members and volunteers help us uh, collect, record, and um, monitor juvenile eels that are making their way up through the estuary. Um, so that more on that's to come um, in about maybe another year or so. So we've been planning on that and we actually heard that we were awarded the grant um, fairly recently. So that's very exciting. So uh, we are all trying to continue uh, the work while staying safe. I know Joel and the rest of the Pinelands Commission and you know other environmental organizations and groups are trying to do the same thing um, with virtual programming. You can see there's a picture of one of our creature features from the summertime, um, our monitoring efforts and research efforts are kicking back in again. Um, they, we have a back to research plan, um, though I don't think we're 100% quite yet, but um, we are getting back to it. You can see um, 
Greg and our research coordinator, Tom Grotus in the boat there staying socially distant and wearing masks. And then you can see me during our BioBlitz event. We had um, people help with a moth survey during the event too, which was really interesting. So we are assisting them in surveying moths, moths that were in the, the, the salt marsh right there. Um, so that was during the BioBlitz. Um, so trying to, um, you know, trying to do our best and, uh, and keep the work going while still staying safe. All right, and so that's about it from me. And again, if you, you know, want to sign up for any notifications about our programs and events, um, please feel free to email me. That's my email right there. Um, we usually do, um, we usually schedule programs on a seasonal basis, but because of COVID, I switched to a more month to month update on virtual programs. Um, so I just sent out the September one, not that long ago. And then we'll be planning for the next couple of months um, as well as, you know, and all of our events and programs are gonna continue to be virtual until, um, until otherwise stated. Um, but for right now, that's how we're updating um, everybody that um, is interested. Um, you can also follow us on our social media pages. We have a Facebook, we have Twitter, Instagram, we have a YouTube channel that you can actually do like Pinelands Commission, you can watch these programs later on. Um, some of them though, other presenters, not all presenters do want theirs uh, posted on, on YouTube, which is fine. Um, and then also, if you do want to learn more or start volunteering, maybe, you know, become a volunteer on our uh, trails team or maybe help with our monofilament line scouting team, you know, uh, those are all volunteer events that we are volunteer opportunities that we are allowing because they can do it solo. Um, our, our other volunteer uh, opportunities, though, are kind of on hold until then. But if you do want to join one of those other teams, um, you can find our volunteer application on jcnear.org. So, all right, um, that's, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I will open it up to questions. Um, so if you do have a question, um, you just call that number and then enter in that meeting ID. And an important part though, is to mute your computer if you're calling, so there's no feedback. Um, and I'll, I'll start with questions. And I'll put my, whoops, sorry. Caitlin, thank you very much. That was a very uh, thorough and uh, informative presentation about the what is encompassed by the reserve and then all the programs that you're doing. And it was really neat to see how you guys are uh, handling the current uh, COVID situation and uh, still out there working, still monitoring and just changing a little bit to uh, adapt to the situation. Yeah, um, thank you. So. And I know, yeah, you guys are doing the same and, um, you know, still trying to to do as, as much as we can during this, you know, really uncertain time, so. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that there is stress, uh, but the work's gotta continue. I was fortunate to spend the last two days uh, out in the cedar swamps and in the some vernal ponds measuring the, the water level. So uh -huh. like I said, the work's still there. It's just a matter of doing it in a safe and, uh, you know, cautious manner. Absolutely. And it's all like learning as we go too, right? Yep. Um, with all these things as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it is nice to have a, a, a great partner like Pinelands Commission and others that are in the area too, because we, we're sharing a lot of what we're doing. So our programs, for example, are a little bit different to Pinelands, um, but that's, you know, that's totally fine, like whatever works for whichever organization, um, but having that support, sharing tidbits on on what each other is doing and if it worked, if it didn't work. <laughs> yep. So it's really interesting to hear from everybody. Yeah, you know, we're very fortunate to be uh, in a community with so many, uh, you know, environmentally minded different organizations and agencies. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, with the Barney Bay Partnership and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, it's great to, for all of us different entities to come together, kind of pool our resources, uh, particularly in education. We all seem to work very well together and do a lot of uh, cooperative education programs. Yep. Um, 
which we'll look to continue in the future. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so I don't know um, how the call will come in, Joel, but um, do you get a notification on your end? Yeah, uh, what will happen is I'll uh, see that somebody is uh, called in and uh, I'll admit them into our Zoom meeting and uh, they'll be live on the air and they'll ask their question. Okay. And um, if nobody calls in, then we're not going to find anybody, obviously. But uh, as soon as someone does call in, uh, we'll give it just a minute or two to see if there's anybody out there. And, uh, you know, I'll let you know and I'll let them know that they're live and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear their question. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. Um, thanks for bearing with us with some of our technical difficulties. I'm not really sure uh, what happened, but we were able to eventually launch the live broadcast. And, uh, you know, if you missed the beginning of it, just feel free to go watch the first couple minutes back, uh, you know, from the beginning on our YouTube channel, uh, if you're out there watching. No, That's the thing. It's a learning experience. Every, every uh, virtual program is uh, new, uh, a, new, a new road to travel down. Yeah, I was just about to say the same thing. You know, it's a, a bit of a learning curve. Um, and everybody had to learn really quick. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you still get the technical issues um, sometimes. And that's just how it goes. So yeah. I totally hear you. I find lots of solace when I'm watching the, you know, the national news and some of the, the uh, cable channels that they all, they all have the same issues that we seem to sometimes. So mm -hmm. I don't feel so bad about a, a, a little audio mess up or they drop somebody here and there. Yeah. Uh, it's just par for the course. Yeah. I was watching the, the today show a little bit this morning before logging in and, you know, they have their, um, uh, they, their guests that they bring in to do like cooking demos and they, that was all virtual. So yeah, it's, it's, everybody's in the same boat. Yep. Right. Well, uh, no one's called yet, but we'll uh, give it another minute, I guess, just so someone has the opportunity. And, okay. Um, yep. Yeah. And pe people are welcome to also uh, email me if they have any questions. Um, <clears throat> or want to get in on our email list um, and, and get updates about our, our programming. Um, so, um, you know, we're accessible that way too, if you do have maybe a, like a more in-depth question or something that you just want to know about. Yeah, you know, your, your guys' location down there on Great Bay Boulevard or AKA Seven Bridges Road is always, uh, for living local in the area, it's Tuckerton in Little Lake Harbor. It's uh, you know one of the, the best spots we have, and always has a special place in my heart just from growing up in the area. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. and then the and the bio blitz, what um, the self guided bio blitz was a, a fun way to um, to to get out there and to contribute to something, um, you know, contribute to data, but also just have a, like a nice day outside um, and something something to do and something different and just enjoy the, the scenery out there on, on Great Bay Boulevard <clears throat> and our trail too. Um, so that's, that's another reason why we wanted to, to do the bio blitzes too. Um, you know, the, the weather was getting warmer and, and nicer and that's, you know, it's just a special place to be. Yeah, I agree. Uh, definitely, there's uh, certain spots that are some of probably my favorite places in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually tied into fishing spots, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, I guess we're going to let it go for today. Uh, like Caitlin said, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email her or email us at the uh, Pinelands yep. Commission. There's uh, the the address for Caitlin. And uh, Caitlin, thanks again. Great job, really a uh, thorough presentation. And I look forward to working with you guys uh, in the future. Yeah, sounds good, us too. Uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you soon, Joel. All right, have a great day. Okay, thanks, you too. Bye everybody, thank you. Yeah. See everybody out there. Interesting.